Hello everyone, Chef Colette here. So sorry, I was having technical difficulties in the new kitchen, but I'm here. So welcome to all of you. And if you're watching on the replay, welcome to you too. Thank you for your patience. Oh my goodness, it's been all the things. This is the Dough Doctor. As I said, I'm Chef Colette, and we are in a magical new location. The new kitchen is beautiful and worth all the stress and effort. Please let me know if you like what you see. Um, I really am grateful for my old kitchen, but this is so much more convenient. And uh, you're, you're able, you'll be, you'll be able to see everything. So welcome to the show. And today we're going to finish up our strawberry cream cheese tart. Remember two weeks ago, two weeks ago, this wasn't even happening. I had gotten wind that this apartment was available, but I didn't know that I would get it. And that set in motion two weeks of madness and mayhem. Um, so yes, and I want you guys to know, I if I'm, if I'm a little less energetic, I am injured during the move hauling things. I fell and I'm not a faller, but I fell and I busted, I bruised my ribs on the left side of my body. So it's a little challenging to take a deep breath, but it's okay, the show must go on, right you guys? So we missed a week so that I could get all this together and I have to give a shout out to my amazing first husband, Craig, who came, he's retired, he jumped in the car and helped make this happen. He's not a social media person, so he won't hear this, but you guys will. So um, we're sending it out to the universe. Thank you, life of irony. Yeah, it was, but you know, things happen. There's a lot of chaos in moving. And that's something after I get through the questions, I'd like you guys to think about your baking pantries, wherever you store your equipment, and what is the strangest, most unusual, or most cherished, cher I can't talk, cherished pan that you hold on to. What, what is it? Because for me, it's Lammy. I know Lammy is backwards because we're on X, uh, we're on Instagram, but this is this is a lamb cake mold, and I moved it. Now, you guys, in the last two weeks, I've gotten rid of a lot of stuff and a lot of baking stuff, but I could not part with the lamb mold. So I want to know what is your lamb mold? What do you move? even if you don't use it on a regular basis. And because I did move Lemmy, you're going to see a lot more of him. He's going to celebrate every holiday. All right? Because I sweat blood the past, the past two weeks. And, and uh, yeah, this guy, he's going to represent. All right, so... Let's get to our questions. Put Lammy down. He's, he's, Lammy's so noisy. He's just like, he would have freaked out if I threw him out. And again, if you like that, I feel like I'm on a set in this kitchen. I didn't feel like that in the old kitchen. I mean, I was grateful, don't get me wrong, but, um, but this, this is why I jumped on it. This is why I destroyed my life for two weeks and then put it back together. I'm so dramatic, but you guys know that. All right, so questions. And I'm on my newer iPad, which has a very funky camera eye line. So if I look a little off or cross-eyed, that's why. All right, so let's get to the questions. And then if you have questions, drop them in the comments below and we'll get to them too. All right. So for our strawberry cream cheese tart, I had a question come in that was, would it be okay to substitute raspberries in place of the strawberries? Absolutely. 
You could do really any fresh fruit. You could even treat this cream cheese tart like a fresh fruit tart and do the, you know, the beautiful berries or pineapple or mango or kiwi or whatever. The one thing, whatever you like to put on your fresh fruit tarts, blueberries would work as well. I just chose strawberries because we're getting into strawberry season. We're not quite there. I'm in California, so it's always kind of strawberry season here. Sometimes they're a little worse for wear, but we can usually always get them. But in different parts of the country, it, they can be challenging to find. We're almost there. Actually, where we are, if anyone has seen rhubarb in the market or is growing rhubarb, put it in the comments because strawberry and rhubarb are natural partners. They're very sexy together. And, and, I, and rhubarb usually comes into season before strawberries. So if you've got rhubarb, put it in the comments and let us know. So yes, raspberries are a total go. And then another question I got in the two weeks was, can I use buckwheat flour instead of all purpose or bread flour in any recipe? And unfortunately, ooh, wait, wait, wait. Put a pin in the buckwheat. Pistol Packing Mama has two rhubarb plants and she, she grows rhubarb. Awesome. And then um, JGF, JGF triple one, also, oh, that's great. I miss, I used to grow rhubarb and I, and oh, when it comes into season and it's just so exciting, I digress. Back to our question. Okay, can I substitute buckwheat for all purpose of bread flour? I said no. And the reason is buckwheat is technically a grass. It has no gluten forming properties. It's really delicious. If you've ever had blini, I don't know if I'm saying that right. Blini, blini, I'll have to look that up. And caviar, the little buckwheat pancakes with the dollop of sour cream and the caviar. They're super posh and totally delicious. Um, and usually have champagne with them because it's, it's just kind of that very posh world of a dish. That is buckwheat. So they can, be, they can go in a crepe batter. They can go in a pancake batter. They can go in a yeasted dough. Buckwheat can be added to a yeasted dough, but it is a small percentage because it's not gonna contribute, it's only gonna contribute flavor and color and texture. It's not gonna contribute any gluten properties, all right? Now, years ago, I had a favorite you guys may have heard of this cookbook author. I don't know if she's still living. Her name is Beth Hensberger. And she wrote a series of really lovely creative bread books in the 80s. Next time you're noodling around on Amazon, look her up. That was Beth Hensberger. I got her first book in 1988 and I was so inspired. And she wrote a bunch of bread books, and then she wrote books about the slow cooker and rice cooker, which were really excellent. And so there is a point to this story, my bakers. She had a bread called Sun and Moon, and it was uh, a dough where cornmeal was added. The dough was like a basic French dough, but in one half of it, some of the flour had been removed and cornmeal or semolina were added, you could choose. And in the other half of the dough, um, a little bit of the flour was removed and buckwheat was added. And then it was braided. So it was this really beautiful cornmeal buckwheat bread. And I'll never forget it. I made it when I had my restaurant in my bed and breakfast way back when in Ashfield, Massachusetts. Anybody from Massachusetts who's in the, on the show or in the audience, please put it in the comments. That was a long time ago, but a beautiful, beautiful bread. So that's the thing with buckwheat. We can use a small portion of it 
I would say no more than 20% of the overall flour and make sure if you're doing a yeasted dough, you're using a strong bread flour and it should just give this really evocative, dusty, not in a bad way dusty, but just sort of a, a very earthy, lovely flavor. So that's that question. And then from our Baker Cyrus, and actually a couple things from our Baker Cyrus, um, from our Baker, Baker Cyrus, when do you choose? Choose and choose wisely. When do you use an Italian buttercream? And when do you use a Swiss buttercream? Really great, thoughtful question, Cyrus. It depends on your preference. Now you guys know that I've been teaching since dinosaurs roamed the earth, or sometimes it feels like that. Actually, I came to LA to teach at Le Cordon Bleu in 2004. So it's really only been about 19 years of, of teaching, you know, in, in culinary school and pre-professional. So a lot of teaching, and then of course, teaching, just teaching, teaching, teaching all over, everybody. And it depends on your preference. It's been my experience that people fall in love or cake bakers and decorators fall in love with one or the other. Swiss buttercream and Italian buttercream are made. Italian buttercream, egg whites in the mixer on a medium low speed and then hot sugar syrup, 240 degrees, poured over the egg whites to kill, to heat those egg whites up so that foodborne illness is killed. Specifically, any foodborne pathogens that are related to eggs and egg whites, all right? I could give you a laundry list, but just know that they die at 144 degrees Fahrenheit. I don't know the Celsius, but you guys do the math if you live in a Celsius world. Okay, and then the Swiss buttercream, the egg whites and sugar are heated over a bain-marie or a water bath until they reach about 145 degrees. We don't want 145, 150. If they go any hotter, the sugar's gonna get weird. It's gonna get grainy. So that is, so that's how they're made. I just wanted to put everybody in the picture. I find Swiss buttercream to be smoother when it's applied on the cake and when I'm piping. But Italian buttercream certainly has a ton of fans. For my cake bakers and decorators in the audience, put it in the comments. What is your buttercream of choice, Italian or Swiss? So Cyrus, it doesn't matter. It's which one you like best. The one thing though, any buttercream, Italian or Swiss, then this is one of those culinary school nuggets of wisdom. When you are, you have finished your buttercream and you have that beautiful, gorgeous, fluffy emulsification and it looks like mayonnaise, good mayonnaise, not, you know, not everybody's a mayonnaise fan. Take the whisk off, tap the excess off the whisk, attach the paddle and paddle it on medium speed for about a minute and a half, and that will remove any excess air. So whether it's Swiss or Italian, it will go beautifully smooth on your cake. And what I mean by spongy is you'll be masking your cake and you see little air bubbles. That's what I mean, sort of like a kitchen sponge sort of texture. And that comes, I find that more with Italian more than Swiss, but that little technique about changing to the paddle, giving it a, me, a minute and a half, that is a game changer for you guys. It totally is. Cyrus, great question. Um, thank you. And then uh, we're gonna put a pin in the chocolate paste question. I'm still trying to get a hold of the chef who has it in his craftsy class. Um, I, I hunted down, I know where he, I'm not stalking in a bad way, but I think I have found his contact and I'm going to ask him directly. We are going to go to the source 
because here at the Doe Doctor, we are thorough, absolutely thorough. Or, well, I am, because right now I'm kind of my, you know, I, I do all the things. But you know what? We've leveled up to a new kitchen, and who knows where the next level is going to be, all right? Now I have some sad news. For those of you who have taken my classes for a long time or been my student at Le Cordon Bleu or AI or other places that I've taught when I was teaching on ground, I would wax poetic, and I've done it on the show, about my 58-year-old sourdough starter, Sophia. Well, I have very sad news. Sophia died in the move. She died last Saturday. When a sourdough starter dies, it, begun, it be, begins to smell putrid. Literally, that's the only word, and that's what she did. She just, it was a combination of the chaos, well, it was the chaos, let me just say that. So she passed away, and I buried her yesterday, and I will start over. And because I need to start over, I do want to give a plug for an absolutely marvelous new sourdough baking book that's become available. If for those of you interested in sourdough, I just feel it's a must buy. I bought it the day it came out and it's called The Perfect Loaf, The Craft and Science of Sourdough Breads and it's by Maurizio Leo. All right, so that's my recommendation for you guys and I will build a new starter. I can do it in a week it was just the romance of Sophia that, you know, she was such a good story. So know that if something happens and you lose your starter, like in a spontaneous move, know that you can build another one and life will go on. All right, my next question was, when dipping pretzels in baking soda and water solution, which is how we make pretzels, you know, in our home kitchens. Uh, you can use baker's lye, but it's quite caustic and you wanna wear eyewear and gloves when using it for, my, for those of you who like to make pretzels. The easy and safe way is baking soda and water. And you dip the pretzels in the warm water and baking soda and then you bake them. And the, they are just beautiful with that tight, shiny glaze you know, all the characteristics of a beautiful pretzel. Well, I had a baker write in and ask, and I thought this was a good, thoughtful question. Can pretzels be sprayed with the baking so Can they be sprayed, like in a spray bottle, with the baking and soda solution? Good idea, but no. They really need to be fully immersed and, and have full coverage there's always a little bit of space when we spray, and then also um, the baking soda would clog in the nozzle. So a couple of things, I hate to say no to you guys, I like to find the solution, but that one was a definite no. And then finally, I had a baker write in, she wanted to add color to food color to cake batter, and she wanted some recommendations. Okay, number one, use gel color. Something like Wilton, Americolor, or Chef Master. Any of those three, avoid the liquid colors that are in the grocery store and the little teeny tiny squeezy bottles. They're so cute, but they're only good for Easter eggs. You know, if you're gonna make your own Easter egg dye. Um, for anything else, they are useless because they have too much of a water, too much water activity, too much water content, it'll throw off everything. Um, they're, you know, fine if you're making Play-Doh or Easter eggs or something, you know, that, that um, or, you know, with baking with kids, but really your gel colors for this are what you wanna do. So when coloring cake batters, gel colors, number one. Number two, consider the base. If you have a yellow cake base, what is gonna happen is it's gonna take that color with a yellowish tinge. So if you want a clear color, you wanna use a white cake batter, one that has an egg white base, or if you're using a mix, 
and there's really nothing wrong with mixes, you want to use a, a white cake batter as opposed to a yellow, yellow cake batter. This is a confession. Sometimes I crave that taste, that artificial taste of a mix. I mean, I prefer scratch baking, but every now and again, it's kind of an interesting flavor. All right, that's it for our questions. Let me check the, I gotta reach over here. Um, lots of rhubarb, awesome. Rhubarb growers, great. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is I, I'm going to roll out the tart dough that we made two weeks ago. Well, that's a lie. I actually rolled out the tart dough from two weeks ago. I moved it. I carried it over here. And uh, then, but I made a fresh tart dough super early this morning. I'm going to roll that one out in front of you. I have a 10 inch tart pan with a removable bottom. And then I have, we're gonna make the filling and we're gonna finish a finished tart. So you'll be able to see. None of this will take very long, but we might go over our usual time. I know I want you to get, I want to get you back to your Saturday afternoons and whatever I'm hoping you're baking. So I don't wanna take too much time, but, um, We've got, you know, we, we have a few things going on. I'll try to be as quick and efficient as possible. Now that I have this big island, I have all my tools close by, so should work out pretty well. And for next week, in case you have to bounce, we're gonna cover a classic pot sucre, which is the sweet tart crust that is probably best suited, in my humble opinion, for blind baking for a crust that we bake all the way through and then fill with a cooked filling and then it never goes back in the oven. All right, so let's get going. So here's the tart shell. This is our sweet tart dough that we made uh, two weeks ago. And you know, I just said I made it this morning. This is the one that uses a raw filling. It bakes up really beautifully. You do not need, you can blind bake it, but you don't have to, which is kind of nice. All right, so now, you have two options. You can roll this out in a dusting of flour and as a matter of fact, I have a mixer right here. I'm gonna push that out of the way. Any, okay, I just wanna go back. Any weird pans? Anybody got a lamb cake mold that they may have moved 15 or 20 times? I mean, you know, cause that's normal. All right, so what I'm gonna do, if you're, this is holding together really well. But if you find two things, your dough is kind of square or it's a little bit cracked, you can kind of give it a little bit of a pound just to get it into a round shape, okay? And then I'm just gonna... Oh, the other thing I did when I fell is I fractured my middle finger of my left hand. That was a funny x-ray. I was basically, well, never mind, but yeah, it was crazy. Bruising, fractures, Sophia died, but we have a beautiful kitchen bakers. And anytime it cracks, okay, now that I get it about a half inch thick, now I'm going to roll. And what we want to do is make sure it moves. And I'm just going to roll forward and back. And then I'm going to give it a quarter turn. And where it's cracking, I'm just going to squish it together forward and back. I'm trying not to ruffle it. What do I mean? I'm trying not to do this because that can make, that can make kind of folds. So, 
as you move forward with your baking and you acquire your skill, your, your skill set gets stronger, you'll find these little finesse points will work really, really well. Now the thing about tarts as opposed to pies is that a tart show, shell, show, a tart, we're on a show, a tart shell is thin. 350, 350 Benelli 9231, who is baking along with us, 350. Now we are gonna let this, um, I'm gonna put it in the fridge. You can roll out the tart shell and then chill it overnight in the fridge or let it sit for a couple hours in the refrigerator. And you're gonna find, now this, this particular tart shell does like to crack a little bit. So um, have an offset spatula. If it gets stuck, then you just slide underneath it. That's a really good tip. And if you're like, oh no, I don't want to work in the flour, you can use two sheets of parchment paper. But I like working with this flour, it's fine. We always want to work with the flour, not in the flour. It should never be um, swimming in flour. Okay, that looks good. So I would say my hand is eight inches and that's from the tip of the unbroken middle finger to my wrist, and that's a good way to measure. So my tart pan is 10, I'm at about 14 diameter, we're good. Okay, now to get it in the pan, I've got my offset spatula, and I'm gonna just pick up the dough and roll it onto the rolling pin. Scoot this right up against the rolling pin. Okay, and then you kind of look, make sure, and you drop it like it's hot. Okay, so this looks good. And then, this is very important, bakers, watch. I pick up the edge of the dough and I fold it forward and then back against the um, side of the pan. And if it cracks, I, I don't care. I'm just going to, I'll just patch or pinch. It's very, very forgiving, this dough. Remember, we talked about the science behind this dough two weeks ago, how it has more sugar, so it's very tender. It doesn't form any gluten, or very little gluten, and it doesn't have a lot of butter, so it's a little bit easier, you know, compared to other tart doughs, so it's a little bit easier to handle. So here you guys go. Now I, I want you to see, and at some point I'm gonna figure out an overhead camera, but I may need help to do that, to switch back and forth with my little flowery paws. Cameras do not like flower, I will tell you that. Okay, so now I'm just going to, you may have seen, you know, to form the crust, you may have seen bakers and teachers and chefs run back and forth with the rolling pin. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you ever find yourself having to make a lot of these tarts or mini tarts, watch. I'm just going to take my thumb and I'm going to remove the excess just like this. All right? And that's it. And I have, and then I'm going to come in and I'll save this. I can make some mini tarts. And you can also, this, this dough freezes really well. You can also, um, I just lost my thought as I often do. I think I just said it. You can freeze it and use it another time. It's not a good candidate for cookies. The one we're doing next week, that's the one for cookies. And I'm not gonna fold over anything. I'm just gonna kind of smooth out, got a little flour on my fingers, then take a dry brush and brush away any excess flour. 
because that will dry out the surface of the dough. So here's a look right here. Looks pretty good. So what are we looking for? We're looking for our sides, one, to be at a 90 degree angle. We're looking for a nice smooth base because this dough is a little, it's not fragile, but because of the higher amount of sugar and the smaller amount of butter, you might notice a few hairline cracks and you can just, pat, you can just kind of pinch those together. We don't want to overhandle it, but it's a total you can fix. And then you just take your thumb and flick away the excess. It's a really quick way to get the um, top edge uh, cleaned up. And that's about the thickness. That's about an eighth of an inch. If you're just starting out with tarts and the thickness is your, your shells are a little bit thicker, it's okay. The eighth of an inch is it's, it's a goal, all right? And then the next thing that's gonna happen is, I'm gonna put this stuff off to the side. I'm gonna put this in the refrigerator. And that'll give me a chance to show you the magic of TV reveal. And this has to go on a baking tray. If you bake the tart in the oven without it being supported with a tray, remember it's in two pieces. Some of the butter will leak out and go onto the bottom of your stove and the kitchen will be filled with smoke. So you wanna support it on a tray. You could line it with a piece of parchment or foil, but I, it was okay, I didn't have any residue um, this morning. And in fact, we usually, anytime we're doing cupcakes, we're doing cakes, we're doing tarts or pies, we wanna make sure they're supported by a sheet pan. Really, really important because um, we want that nice, even bake. And then in the case of a two-part pan, we don't want a stinky, smelly kitchen and, you know, any issues. All right, so now, let me just clean this. And we're gonna run through the filling and if there's any questions, let me know. I have the glass mixer, starring the glass mixer today, because I want you guys to see. I have an optional step, and that is straining the filling after mixing. It is a game changer when you're working with cream cheese, because there's not a cream cheese available on the market that doesn't have carrageenan gum or gar guar gum, and they, they congeal, and it's really hard, even with softening the cream cheese and watching our mixing, to, to, to get those infinitesimal lumps out. Again, it's optional. It's covered with fruit, but I do recommend straining it. So I have this. There are, there, I looked on Amazon, this company no longer makes this, but there are, this is called a strainer, a sifter, or a tammy. Um, uh, okay, and then Benelli, I would say it depends on the brand. So the question is, bakers, is pure vanilla bean paste is pure vanilla extract more potent than vanilla bean paste? I noticed the first ingredient of the paste is sugar. So what happens is if the first ingredient is sugar, as you guys know, it's mostly sugar. Or not mostly sugar, but that's the high, well, that's the biggest amount because that's the way they write ingredient lists. So the answer would be yes, pure vanilla extract is more potent than vanilla bean paste if you're using a brand that lists sugar as its first ingredient. Let's see, what else, are we good? 
No, 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 no. AC1353, no great question. Oh my goodness, it's like we rehearsed it. No docking, no docking. When you are baking a filling with the crust bakers, we do not dock it. When we're baking a crust without a filling, then we dock it to make sure that it lays flat and that the steam that's created during the bake doesn't lift up the layers and we get like puffs, which we can poke and they'll go away, but um, great question. No poking with a fork or docking. It's called docking is the term. Great question. Okay, so now I have had my cream cheese out for two hours. No longer than that because I feel, I mean, I taught sanitation for years and food safety, so we want to be under that four hour mark for softening cream cheese. So in the recipe, which is going to go live early Monday morning, I recommend two hours just to soften it at room temperature. It's in the mixer with the paddle attachment. Now we're going to mix in an unusual manner. You, if you've been with me for a long time, you know that when we're working with flour, I usually stop and start a lot. But this is a filling that has no flour in it, so I'm actually going to pour in the sugar and the egg mixture while the mixer is running and I'm going to be between medium low and medium speed. So you're going to have to toggle back and forth. I have my tray of ingredients here and I'm going to show you a trick when we're adding eggs for either creaming method or for something like this where we want this batter to be smooth as possible, but we don't want to overwork it because if we beat too much air into it, our cheesecake filling is going to rise and fall. And you can see this one turned out really gorgeous. It, it, it puffed up a little, which is normal, but it wasn't dramatic. All right. So what I'm going to show you is you're going to mix the, the recipe calls for two eggs and two egg yolks. And you're going to mix the egg yolks. I had my, I had my whisk right here, but I got this one. So we're going to just break up the egg yolks into the egg whites. Because the egg whites are mostly water, 90%. So what's going to happen is if we do this, then it's going to be the fat in the egg yolks is going to be dispersed through the egg whites and we're going to get a smoother, it's going to go together smoothly. The egg, yolk, the egg yolks, these little guys, they're already fat. We don't have to worry about them. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to turn on the mixer to about medium low. And we're just gonna break up the cream cheese. And when it sounds like it, like gum being chewed, you can stop. You wanna have your spatula. And we're gonna quickly scrape down and we gotta get it off the paddle because if it's on the paddle, it's just going around and around. It's not mixing. And you have seen me do this before. This is a trick I stole from Martha Stewart. And you just use your offset to scrape down the paddle. It's pretty quick and efficient. All right. And then, I'm gonna pour in my sugar. You guys can see this. Just kind of pouring in my sugar. And then, because fat carries flavor, we all know this, I've got four grams of pure vanilla extract. 
that's going in. Okay, get my dirty dishes off to the side. I'm gonna rev the mixer to medium. I'm gonna stop it and I'm going to scrape down. And then I'm gonna mix this for about 30 seconds. With, you can make this in the food processor as well, but you're gonna kind of pulse everything. I know we've had food processor conversations, but cheesecake batter made in a food processor doesn't need to be strained. Um, Benelli, 71 grams of sugar. 71 grams of sugar. Okay. All right. Now, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to pour in the eggs. And this is 75 grams of eggs. So we had 71 grams of sugar. 75 grams of eggs. Benelli, I'm so sorry I didn't get you the didn't get the amounts to you guys earlier. I will for our next bake along. And I'm just gonna pour in the eggs. And they're going in beautifully because they're mixed. And I learned this from Chef Albert, who I often talk about. He was the pastry chef who was no doubt the greatest baker of the 20th century. And that's not hyperbole. All right. He never wrote a book. I'm going to have to do it for him. Okay. Now we're going to scrape down and get that bottom, the bottom of that bowl. And then we're going to add our egg yolks. These are, I'm just gonna throw in. That was two egg yolks. And I always try to get large eggs, but we have the weights because you may have your own chickens or you may buy farm eggs from down the road and they're gonna be all different sizes or in your area, the medium eggs may be on sale, and I don't want you to ever feel that you're limited. The next thing that's going to happen is a tiny amount of cornstarch, 10 grams, in 57 grams of milk, or you can use heavy cream, or you can use um, half and half. So, 57 grams of of liquid dairy, milk, half and half, or cream. The cream, it doesn't really matter. 10 grams of cornstarch. And I'm gonna take, this just stabilizes the tart, and I'm just gonna whisk these two together, and then I'm gonna give a good scrape, because we're, you know, I, it's the gums that they use in cream cheese that make, make those lumps. And I know we're gonna strain it, but we wanna have best baking practices all the way through, okay? Again, just scraping this down, making sure, making sure, okay. All right. Oh, great! Marathon Baguette made the lemon bars. All right, Benelli, you good? 57 grams of milk, 10 grams of cornstarch, medium low speed, I'm pouring it in. I really like to use heavy cream. That's my favorite, I think. I, I get good results with all of them. but the milk was open, so I made that decision. All right, let me get this out of the way. Okay, now I showed you this setup. This is also called a tamis. These are available on Amazon, 
And in the blog post, I've got a link for you guys, but um, you be careful because make sure you get one that's at least 10 inches because the smaller ones are, um, they're good for small things, but they're annoying for big things. And I mean annoying, like you wanna throw it, annoying. And this works out very well. And I'm gonna strain it. And you're not gonna lose much putting it through the strainer. In French, these are called, in France, we are from France, these are called tamis. Chefs will use it to make um, all sorts of uh, different things. It's very useful. But you guys can see the lumps, and that was a lot of careful mixing. So I'm just gonna take my spatula, and actually this brand comes with a little strainer, but I really don't want to dirty too much else. A little scraper, losing my words. So there's no loss of batter or very little, but it's as smooth as glass now. It's really, really nice. Okay. Now the last thing I'm gonna do before I grab the tart shell is I'm going to add my lemon zest. If your lemon is small, this just adds a bit of brightness and it's really, really lovely. It is optional. If you'd rather use a little orange or lime bakers, that's up to you. Because remember, once you learn technique, that's what sets your creativity free. So I'm just gonna microplane in, microplaning live. I, I didn't wanna strain this out which is why I'm adding it after straining. Oh my God, it hurts when you fracture your finger. That's all I can tell you bakers. Pain, 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 but it will pass. Not the worst we've been through. Okay, now, I'm just gonna stir that in. Okay, and I'm gonna grab our tart shell. And watch, that's it. It will take all of it. And I actually was so busy with filming and Instagram drama, I forgot to turn on my oven, but that's okay. We're just gonna scoot this into the refrigerator and move on with finishing our finished tart. Okay, all right. So now, look, I have strawberries right here. And if you notice the one, and you guys can do whatever you want. If you notice the one I posted, it was a combination of small strawberries and then sliced strawberries. Well, I didn't, I couldn't find super small ones. So I have, I actually cut mine in half. Anyway, let's just quickly go through this so I can send you off to the rest of your day. I know this is kind of a long demo. But what you're gonna do, for something like this, we do wanna kind of cover, I, I would say that the cream cheese filling isn't, I mean, it's certainly delicious, but it may not be that pretty to look at. I mean, it's okay, and you could leave it exposed, but I'm gonna just quickly cover it. Okay, so I'm using my larger berries first, my larger slices, and I'm pretty sure I have enough. Mm. 
okay? And then, then the other thing you're gonna wanna have handy, um, it's optional, but it's really nice, is some glaze. So you want to have some glaze, and I have that on the stove. Now, whatever you want to do, you are the chef in your kitchen, my bakers. That's what you are. Um, you, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna alternate. But the glaze really does help. The glaze helps the tart stay fresh. In a French pastry kitchen, the glaze is called nappage, which just means to coat. Doesn't mean anything more, more than that. And it's either made with an apple base for clear, a raspberry base for red things, and then like these berries, or for super neutral and versatile apricot. So we make it with apricot jam. And I'm using Trader Joe's apricot jam, but any jam, any brand will work. I'm trying to go quick here because I don't want to keep you guys too much longer. And if you have a pair of tweezers, that's really helpful. Uh, food tweezers or um, I have a chopstick, super helpful. So I can lift this slice, stick this one underneath. I'm just gonna heat up. Oh, here's my whisk. Remember I was like looking for my whisk a few minutes ago. And then in the center, I'm going to put my um, halves. So we have a little bit of height in the center. So this is a little bit quick and you guys can, you know, you do your thing with your tarts and then tag me in them or send them to me so I can see your beautiful work because I live for that, I really do. And, um, Paring knife. Guys, this, this is a phenomenal setup that is here for this, this show and for being able to teach you things. I just have to say, I am so, so grateful. So grateful. So yeah, so this is, I did this in a New York minute don't think I'm gonna win the Coupe de Monde with it, but I'm not trying. The point is to cover the cream cheese. Ooh, that one's kind of ugly. Oh my God, my vanity. It's not even funny, it's crazy. Okay, all right. And then for the finale, what we're gonna do, I have the nippage, which is the warm, it's gotta be warm apricot glaze and I have my favorite brush and I'm just going to paint the berries with the glaze and that's what you're going to do too. The glaze is optional but it does preserve the tart. It does definitely preserve the tart. So um, gives it a little bit of shine, makes it sexy, and a little bit of flavor, a little bit of sass. And you can, any leftover nappage can be saved. Don't feel you need to throw it away. Just put it in a little Tupperware and you can, it keeps for a long time. All right, everyone. So we have our beautiful strawberry cream cheese tart and uh, with our we have baked the filling in the crust, so we didn't have to do any blind baking. But next week, we're gonna go over the finer points of blind baking, and I'm gonna teach you a classic pot sucre. And then the week after, we will use that tart shell to make a beautiful cooked filling. So think about it. Do you want a chocolate mousse? 
Do you want a lemon curd? Bakers, what do you want me to teach you for the filling for our next tart? And lastly, before I let you go, I'm thinking for Mother's Day, our Saturday show before Mother's Day is to show you how to properly dip strawberries in chocolate. So if you like that idea, DM me. And then after Mother's Day, we will move on and we will go back to our final uh, tart, which is gonna be the Italian pasta frolo. Frolla. I wanna teach you that before we finish this tart series. How to be a beautiful tart. There we go. Bakers, thank you so much for joining me. And if you're watching on the replay, thank you for making it this far. It was kind of a long show and I so appreciate you. If you have baking friends, please tell them about the dough, do the dough doctor so that we can continue to grow the audience because that's the key to me taking the show to the next level. Thank you, bakers. Happy baking.